I'm going to read a new book here called Beyond the River of the Dead by D.G. Faber. Prologue. There is still in the world an imaginary and invisible line which is, however, an effective and as much respected as the highest rampart. The reason is simple. On one side is all that we understand by our civilization, on the other the unknown. One of the regions of the terrestrial globe where this peculiar situation prevails is in Brazil, in the state of Mato Grosso, in its northeastern and central districts. The fact that, even today, there has barely begun the colonization of this area of some 1,383,000 square kilometers, more than half a million square miles, inside which my own country of Uruguay could be contained more than seven times, and in which France, Italy, and Spain together could be fitted with room to spare, only confirms the reputation this region has of being unknown territory. Unknown are the sources and the depths of its infinity of rivers, Unknown to a large extent is its topography, and almost unknown are most of the native human beings who live in and are sustained by these territories. Thousands of kilometers of virgin jungle surround the central Mato Grosso, concealing and protecting the jungle dweller from the greed of the white man. But even if the jungle did not intervene so effectually to hide its natural denizens, they would not permit the existing state of things to be changed pacifically. There is one territory which proves this fact conclusively. Its geographical situation can easily be traced on the map, and its reputation is well known to all those who directly or indirectly have attempted to penetrate it. The position of those extensive jungles is approximately longitude 53 west latitude 13 south, and there are well-defined names associated with them, Rio das Mortis in the south and east, Serra de do Roncador, and the upper and lower Zingu to the north. Approximately a hundred years ago, a group of Bandeirantes explorers from Sao Paulo penetrated to the interior of the country they comprised, for the most part, dispossessed persons in search of gold and diamonds following an indefinite route. Dogged by hardships and sufferings, they came at last to a river, the dredging of which suggested the presence of gold and diamonds, and on the banks of which was land suitable for the cultivation of their few necessities, and abounding with game. The Indians who inhabited the river territory were peaceful, complacent, cheap to employ in the labor of planting, of washing, sand in search of gold and diamonds, and of constructing dikes and dams. This situation did not last long, only so long in fact as it took the native to realize that this new friendship was based solely on his own obedience. In the revolt, the first drop of blood that spilled in the river was the blood of the once docile Indian. That drop was followed by a torrent, and hundreds of Indians were killed and tortured. <clears throat> the waters assumed for posterity a prophetic name, the River of Death. One day, the settlers observed dense clouds of smoke to the northeast. The following day, the blaze had come near, but they were not unduly worried. For years they had inhabited that region, and they thought there was no tribe sufficiently powerful to withstand their firearms. What did they did not know was that the most combative warriors in Brazil, the Zavantes, were advancing and won their periodical raids. Once more the river lived up to its name. The settlers' carbines were powerless to keep at bay thousands of warriors accustomed to fighting in the jungle, and whose marksmanship with bow and arrow was prodigious. Only three of the settlers escaped and lived to reach Suiba, the state capital. The Zavante Indians were pleased with the new territory they had conquered, 
so much so that they dislodged a great warlike tribe called Bororos after a bloody struggle to become the sole and absolute owners of thousands of square kilometers of territory. As time marched on, the Zavantes remained faithful to their purest tradition by which they have always preserved themselves, their combative warrior heritage. For the civilized world, there was a tacit warning in the rudimentary maps that existed of that part of Brazil. There was something sinister about the state of Mato Grosso. That river of death was linked with a feared and bellicose tribe, and to try to go beyond the frontiers of the territory occupied by the Zavantes was immediately to expose oneself to the peril of violent death. Generally speaking, this territory would have remained unheard of by the layman had it not been for something which aroused and intrigued people even in the remotest corners of the earth. It began with the expedition of the English colonel Percival Fawcett and culminated in his disappearance. To this day, the name conjures up legendary mystery and excites the imagination of everyone who feels attracted by the adventure of exploring the unknown. Although Colonel Fawcett's expedition merely skirted the fringe of the Zavante zone in its approach to the upper and lower Jingu, where he disappeared, its influence, and above all, the conjectures that have been woven around his uncertain fate, awakened curiosity concerning the region. That curiosity has proved tragic. Numerous rescue expeditions never returned. Others came back with few survivors to relate the most hair-raising stories about seemingly endless jungles and their hostile inhabitants. Scientific expeditions replaced those of adventurers seeking renown, but their fate was the same. A circle of death seemed to lower over that huge inhospitable land. Scientists were followed by settlers who met with similar disaster, Salzian missionaries, and even functionaries of the service for the protection of the Indians did not always escape death. Seekers for gold and diamonds, greedy for the riches that abound in those rivers, took the risk, but invariably their corpses were borne along by the river's current, riddled with arrows, or with the skull smashed by the mace, or severed with a slash of the lance. The river of death even today speaks this language of blood, yet the irresistible attraction held by that territory and its inhabitants continues to draw like an enchanted magnet. The land of Mato Grosso, popularly called the immense jungles of permanent mystery, have always impressed those who visited them, and returned alive, and no genuine explorer has ever belittled the dangers. In the Mato Grosso, there are malaria and wild animals, jaguars, boa constrictors, alligators, piranhas, venomous rays, fish, and deadly snakes, and all the tribulations of tropical countries in the form of tiny, voracious insects, and there is the aggressive Indian ready to attack without the slightest provocation. For is he not the true lord and master of this domain? But there are other so-called explorers who would tell you that the Mato Grosso is a civilized progressive zone. They have traveled no further than the state capital of Suaba or the immediate surroundings of Campo Grande. And this is quite true of these parts. But the virgin jungle remains in the interior, still largely unexplored, abounding in every conceivable danger and vicissitude which civilized man is ill-accustomed to confronting. It therefore behoves every expedition worthy of the name to recognize the chances it will have to take in invading a hostile and aggressive zone, whilst one should not expect ghostly terrors to be lurking at every step one must submit to an exhausting struggle not exempt from sufferings and overwhelming toil, with continual alertness and precaution. The jungle has an inflexible code, which man must respect and understand if he wishes to preserve his life. But the same is true of a city, which also has a precise set of rules that must be apprehended, and complied with unless one wants to fall 
a victim to the advances of civilization.